So, hello everybody to my introductional talk to Spring Batch. Um, I'm Tobias, I work for Concentric for two years now, and uh, yeah, I did a lot of Java enterprise development before as well. So, uh, yeah, I worked in all the layers, you can say. I did front-end development, but uh, in the recent three years, I concentrated on backends, did a lot of batch processing, batch programming, a lot of messaging architecture, and something like that. And I worked with uh, yeah, Spring Batch a lot. Yeah, I don't need a fancy uh, Erlang matrix program to print out my Twitter handle. It's here. And, um, yeah, I blog a lot about um, Spring Batch. Um, you can see it on the company blog. Um, so before I start my talk, uh, I would like to know of you um, who's familiar with the Spring Framework. Okay, that's good. That's pretty pretty much people. Um, and who's familiar with Spring Batch? Who knows something about Spring Batch? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Didn't expect that there would be anybody here, but it, it's good. <laughs> um, so it's an introductory talk, so today um, I will uh, have these four topics. First, I will introduce um, yeah, batch processing in general a little bit. Um, and then I will uh, tell about the Spring Batch basics and then dive a little bit deeper into some features. And in the end, I will speak about some um, news that have been come up recently in the batch space, in the Java batch space. So everybody can hear me well, so it's okay, technically? Okay, good. So let's start with the batch processing. Mm. So this is a kind of general batch processing pattern. We have some uh, sources of data where we read from. This is yeah, a queue, a database, or a file. And we read this data record for record, then we process the data. Um, that can be anything, any business logic, any uh, validation, any transformation, anything. And then we write those data again to some sources, data sources like yeah, queues, databases, or files. Um, yeah, these uh, data sources can be anything. Um, Spring Batch has a lot of support for those fancy new and US, no SQL data stores as well. So, uh, but it comes from, from the traditional batch processing perspective where a lot of files and um, relational databases are involved. Mm. Yeah, another uh, important characteristic of batch processing is that it's a long-running process, so um, without user interaction. So we started and it runs maybe for two hours, processing data, processing data, and uh, yeah, and then it finished. And all you can do about it uh, as a user is uh, maybe stop it uh, abnormally, uh, watch how the data goes, uh, how the data is processed, but there's no normal user interaction in between. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, what, what kind of problems do you address with this pattern? I think it's quite obvious, but uh, I will give you some, some examples anyway. Um, so uh, I work for an insurance company, and uh, insurance companies and banks are some of the, the, um, the companies that have traditionally a lot of batch processing. So, for example, um, if we have, uh, yeah, insurance companies have um, a lot of contracts for uh, of the customers in their data, uh, in their data stores, and like once a month, they need to process all these contracts to send out letters, to um, do the caching, or maybe to send out money if it's a life insurance, and this is usually done then with batch processing. So we have a certain point in time where we have to process a lot of data, and then this data is processed through batch process uh, processing. Another, um, another important uh, um, use case is, of course, import and export. Um, it's uh, still the case that a lot of companies um, exchange data in form of files, and then uh, you need to import this data in your databases, and yeah, you can use this pattern for reading this data from, from the files and then transform it into the um, structure that you need and um, save it to the database then. And I think you can think of a lot of more use cases for this. So, um, yeah, batch processing is a quite old topic. Um, it's uh, very much older than um, Hadoop. It's much older than uh, all those NoSQL stores. It's much older than uh, the World Wide Web or Java. Um, as it's even, I guess it's even much older than uh, the first graphical user interface. 
So um, still a lot of companies do their batch processing on mainframe systems with, um, with uh, historic languages like COBOL. And um, yeah, but we noticed during the last years that uh, a lot of companies are switching to Java for doing their batch processing. So um, they, uh, they see the need that you know, the COBOL developers are getting old and there are no new, new COBOL developers or they want to um, put their batch processing in the distributed uh, systems and not on the mainframe. And um, yeah, that's why they need, uh, see the need to switch to Java. And uh, if you do that, it would be nice to have some framework, some support that you don't need to uh, do everything for yourself that uh, yeah, you need to do when you're doing batch processing. And that's uh, where Spring Batch comes in. Um, yeah, foundation of the Spring Batch framework is of course the, the Spring framework that uh, yeah, many of people, many people of you know. Um, and I will go now through some features that uh, that are that's important for I think every batch processing, and that uh, Spring Batch is providing. The first thing is transaction management. If you if you're doing um, a batch job on on a, on a database and um, it's running for two hours. It's really obvious that you cannot have one transaction. You cannot just uh, start a transaction and end it after two hours. So there must be some commits of interactions in uh, of transactions in between, and uh, there must be there will probably will be some rollbacks. There, there new, new transactions have to be uh, built up. So um, Spring Batch is taking this uh, work for you. Um, you, have, you can concentrate on the business logic and Spring Batch is doing this committing and creating new transactions for you. Um, yeah, second uh, important feature is uh, skipping. Um, you can guess if, you, if you're writing a batch and it runs over like a, like a million records, there may be some record in it that's not uh, that's, that cannot be processed by the batch job. There maybe uh, with our business processor, um, they're throwing an exception because it, it has some error in it. Um, so the skipping functionality uh, gives you the possibility to define certain error situations that um, um, lead that to the point that, that uh, the batch is not stopped completely. <laughs> But the item that is causing this error is skipped. So it's, uh, you have the choice to do something else with this item, and the job uh, continues running on the other, on the other records. So then we have retry. Mm, it's a little bit similar to skip. Um, if you have some business logic that uh, yeah, maybe uh, run on errors, that on those errors are um, yeah, uh, would be on the retry not the same. For example, if you have a, if you access a web service uh, in your business processor um, and you have a connection problem, then likely in the next try, this connection problem won't be there and um, you can process the data. So um, this is the, the possibility to configure a retry to say on the certain error conditions, for example, for yeah, the web service, uh, the connection error of the web service, you just retry to the process the data. And very important, um, what you always want to have is persistent job, meta, persistent job metadata. So you want to see um, like uh, one month afterwards, which, uh, how many jobs did run, what was their, um, um, what was their, uh, their status at the end, did they run well, uh, were there problems? So you need some kind of data store to persist this metadata. Um, and uh, Spring Batch is providing um, yeah, SQL, um, 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 yeah, SQL statements for, uh, for, all, uh, um, for a lot of relational databases to create this uh, persistent metadata, uh, meta uh, tables. And um, yeah, it will write to these tables to um, this, this, this metadata. And with it comes the restart possibility. Um, if you have a failed batch job, because maybe some record was, uh, um, yeah, was erroneous, and you want to restart the batch, but you don't want to 
Um, you don't want to uh, uh, process all the data again that was processed before. You want to restart the batch at the moment, at the data, uh, at the record that was the last record that, that was processed successfully. And um, Spring Batch provides uh, possibilities to do this. And um, yeah, this uh, always, uh, of course, you need some persistent <laughs> metadata for it. If you don't have persistent metadata, you cannot do a restart because then uh, the data is gone. And uh, some more, uh, another important thing that we're using in a project a lot as well is that there are scaling uh, possibilities built in, in Spring Batch. So usually, if you don't do anything about it, you have one thread that is processing the data, reading the data, um, processing the data, and writing the data. But um, yeah, if, you th if you see that it's not, not enough um, speed for your batch job, you can do um, parallel processing. So you can spin it up in, in an, a lot of threads, or you can even distribute it over a lot of machines if you want. Yeah. So any questions to that until now? OK. So let's uh, dive into, a spring, into the Spring Batch basics now. Um, we, we, I will start with um, the domain vocabulary, so the, the, um, the words that you know, the nouns that you have to know when you speak with other people that know Spring Batch. Um, I think they are, they are quite obvious if you uh, know a little bit, or, bit about batch processing. But anyway, we'll get into them. So we have the job. The job contains several steps. So the job is like a container for, for several steps. The step is, um, is a, um, a, the, where the real processing of data uh, really happens. So for example, you may have uh, one step that copies uh, a file to a, a certain, um, um, yeah, certain folder. And then the second step is processing that file. That could be uh, two steps. But um, you can have any number of steps in your job. And you can have any number, you can have a certain flow uh, regarding to the end state of the uh, steps that you, yeah, you can define anything you want there. So a step is the, the place where the real work happens. Um, the item, item is the word for, for a record, for one record that you want to process, that you want to read or write. And then we have the item reader. The item reader is the component that reads items from any source it can be, like I said, a database, a queue, anything. Mm. We have the item processor that does the processing. It gets the item from the item reader and can do something with it. And then it gives the item to the item writer, which is responsible for writing this item to any data source that you want. And one more important noun is chunk. As I said before, um, Spring Batch is taking over transaction management. So you can define how many items you want to have in one transaction. And the chunk is like bundling a bundle over all items that are in one transaction, that are processed in one transaction. So, um, yeah, um, the job is configured as, an, uh, as a spring configuration. So uh, I will have the example here for XML, but uh, since uh, Spring Batch 2.2, you can do it in Java config as well. I will have an example for Java config later in the slides. Um, so the domain-specific language, you know, the, the domain vocabulary that I just told you, it appears directly in the XML. So the central elements are the job, as I said. It gets a um, unique ID, which is the name of the job, if you want to refer to it. So this is like a, um, yeah, a Spring configuration. I, I mean, many people of you know Spring. So um, if you they have a certain namespace for it, um, you know, there are different namespaces if you use Spring. So, for example, there's a const context namespace, the JDBC namespace, or if you use Spring integration, the int namespace. And uh, they have a special namespace for the batch um, um, definition as well. 
and these are elements of this batch namespace. Mm. So you can guess after the start, a job, we get the step. Here it gets an ID as well. In this configuration, I have just one step, but of course there can be more steps and we can, have, we can define a flow between this, those steps. So then it's the tasklet, um, and then we have the chunk element. Mm. This is the uh, important element for chunk processing. Um, so we define here the reader that is responsible for reading my items. Um, this is a ref reference to a Spring Bean, so we have to have some uh, configuration, uh, some Spring Bean configuration with an ID, my reader. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's building up this component. The same with the processor and the writer. We have here references to the uh, components as well. And the important uh, thing that I said before, you can define a commit interval. That's the number of items that are uh, in one chunk, that are in one transaction. So in this case, we have we process only one uh, item per transaction. Yeah, Those, this is a very simple job definition, but I think it's, yeah, it's quite good understandable. So yeah, um, the reader and the processor and the writer have to implement certain interfaces. So we have the item reader interface um, that just has one method, that method is the read method, that just returns an item, and you, it's a uh, generic typed item, so it can be anything. Um, and then we have the processor that is typed with two, item, two types because um, it takes one item and gives one back, so it process the, processes the item and it doesn't have to be the same object. It can be uh, another object um, and can be a completely other type of object. That's why we have here two types for the generics. And then we have the item writer. The item writer takes a list of items um, I will explain in a minute why it's a list and not one item. Um, that we, uh, yeah, will, we will see it in a minute. So those are those main components that you need to, uh, when you write a batch job that you have to implement. But luckily, um, Spring Batch offers a lot of implementations for these uh, interfaces as well. Um, for, uh, for especially for the readers and writers, because the processor is uh, it's the place where usually your business logic resides, so um, that's what you have to program yourself, but the reading and the writing um, is more or less generic in, in a lot of use cases, and um, yeah, you can use Spring Batch components for it. So we have yeah, components, reader writers uh, for, for writing in, uh, into a database or for reading from a database, for flat files, for XML files, for JMS queues, for JPA and Hibernate, and there are a lot more. For example, MongoDB uh, is there as well, or Neo4j, or uh, yeah, a lot of more item readers and item writers. It's um, yeah, a very good thing to start because um, if, you, if, you're sim if you have simple bad jobs, you, it may happen that you don't even write any code. You just define your uh, XML and then it's fine. Um, yeah, I will just so that's a very big advantage of Spring Batch that it has all those components readily available, and that it, there are a lot of um, components adding to uh, adding to every version. So we, now we will see how the, the processing, the real processing, works. Um, so this is a how the step is um, executed. So one step is executed. So when the step begins, there will be a transaction opened, um, and then um, items are read. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the, this is a condition. If item, uh, if, yeah, the important thing is here, the completion policy is fulfilled. Completion policy, uh, in, a, in the case that we see before, seen before, is like um, the commit interval. So the, complete, the simple completion policy that you get if you don't change the completion policy is um, that you read commit interval items here. 
So, but as, as uh, Spring Batch is very configurable, you can add your own completion policy. So, if you have a, want to have a time-based completion policy, so you want to read items for like three seconds, then it's uh, fine as well. Then you can plug in your own completion policy. But in general, if you use this commit interval uh, attribute, then the completion policy is uh, fulfilled when uh, commit interval items are read. So. So we just read here, let's say commit interval is five. We, the read method of the item reader is called five times. And then um, the list of these items, the five items, are reached to the processor phase. And here, for each item, the item processor is called. Um, after that, we have again another list, um, this time maybe of another type, as, you, as we have seen before. The output type of the item processor must not be the input type. And this uh, list of items is handed to the item writer completely as a full list. That's, um, yeah, that's the case because um, you want to make use of, uh, for example, batch JDBC updates. Um, if we get the full list here, we can, yeah, we can write batch JDBC statements to, um, to write those five items in a batch statement into the, to the database, so we have an uh, advantage here if you want to, if you get all the items. Mm. Yeah, what I said, what well, I have here, um, when the read method returns null, then it's an indication for Spring Batch that there is no more data to read, so that the step can be finished now. And um, so if we, if, the, if we don't get null, uh, then Another transaction is opened and we continue reading. So, so in the next time, five items that are read. And um, if item, the item uh, is null, then the, finish, uh, the step is finished and um, yeah, we process with the next step or we end the job if that was the last step in the job. Questions about that? No. So then um, we saw the, the XML where the uh, job and the step is defined. So you can think of these um, job and step defin definitions like, uh, like of templates. So if we, um, if we execute a job, then we of course need some more, um, uh, if we will execute the job and want to save it to a database or something like that, we need some more uh, objects to handle that. So this is like a template we have a job uh, and there are x uh, yeah, a number of steps in it but if you really start a job then you need you get a job instance so this is the job of caching for the division a and this is the concrete instance caching division a on 22nd 9th of uh, 2013 so the job instance is persisted to the database and we can see uh, if the job was successful or if it failed or something like that. And it's um, um, identified by the job parameters. So in this case, we may have the job parameter of the date when we want to do the caching. Um, so if, we, um, if the next time a job is started with the same parameter, it cannot be started because um, the, job is really, the job instance is identified by those job parameters. It was a little bit weakened uh, for the version 2.2. Now we can have non-identifying job parameters, but in general, um, if you use it like that, then the job parameters are all identifying. So, but uh, then we have still the restart possibility that I mentioned before. So what happens if, if this instance is now going wrong, if, it's, if there's an error in it, and then we want to restart it. And that's why we need another object, that's the, the job execution. And the job execution is doing the real work. So this is caching division A on 22nd, 3rd of, uh, three of uh, 2013, the first try. So in general, we have just one try because uh, I hope in general our bad job is not failing. So this is a one-to-one -one, uh, normally. But if we have uh, the problem that, that our job execution fails, and we want to do a restart, then we'll get another job execution. So we have one job execution for the first try that failed and then another job execution for the second try that uh, wasn't su successful. And we have the step execution 
um, object that uh, yeah, is related to the step. So uh, this is where we, we get data like um, how many items were processed in that step um, and uh, how many of them were skipped or how many of them were uh, erroneous. So, and we, of course, we need some more components to do the infrastructural stuff. Um, we have um, a job repository that's an infrastructure component to save uh, um, the job data, for example, for, to save the job executions that are processed, to, to load job executions, and so on. And we have a platform transaction manager. Uh, this is an interface of the Spring Core framework, uh, so I think most of you know that. Um, so we need, um, uh, for the, doing the transaction management, we need a transaction manager, manager that uh, helps us doing that. Um, so one implementation is a database transaction manager, or another implementation could be a JP, JTA transaction manager if you do your batch processing on an uh, application server, for example. And then another very important infrastructure component is um, the job launcher that's uh, responsible for launching jobs and for restarting jobs and so on. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, look into the Spring Batch features, like I said. Um, so the restart feature. Um, so on a job start, uh, a job and uh, there is checked. Uh, so we start a job with uh, the job and job parameters. So first thing is we, we check if for this job parameters there is already existing a job instance. So we I assume now that um, the job instance uh, does not exist, so it is created with a job parameters that we provided when starting the job. So the job execution starts running and then there's an error. So this job execution stops and state failed and is saved to the database like that. And the job instance is uh, also in the state failed and saved to the database like that. Yeah, they get the status. So now we do a restart. The restart is just starting this job with the same parameters again. And then um, the question arises again, with this job parameters, is there already a job instance existing? If there would be a completed job instance, so a job instance without any error, then this uh, job start would be rejected and there would be, we would, be, would have been told that uh, we cannot execute this job again because it already was complete. So now, but, but now it's in a failed state, so uh, this is um, considered as a restart then. So a new job execution is created uh, that gets access to uh, data of the other job execution uh, to be able to proceed with the same item that was the last item that was successfully processed in the first place. And then this the run successful. Now there's, hmm? okay. There's a little bit more to, in, to it, but uh, yeah, I think it's too much for here now. Um, so we have uh, the skipping uh, ability. So this is configured like that. We can uh, include skippable exception classes here. So in this case, uh, the, if there an error occurs in one of those um, components, that's an illegal argument exception, uh, the error would be skipped. So the item would be skipped and the job would continue. And we can specify a skip limit. So um, the maximum of skipped items is 20, then the job fails anyway. Um, so I will go over this slide because then otherwise we don't have enough time. Um, and uh, yeah, this third thing is uh, our listeners. Listeners get active at certain points in the, of time at the execution of a job. So there are different times, the job, uh, the different types. The job execution listener has two methods, uh, before job and after job, and they get active before job and after job. Um, and it's configured like this. You can have here our uh, listeners tag in the job uh, area, under the job, and you configure the listener. And here the reference again 
is a, a spring bean that's configured somewhere else. Job execution listener is an interface uh, that you have to implement to do your logic there. And then we have a step execution listener that has before step and after step. And this is configured on the step level, like here. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it, gets, um, yeah, it gets active before the step starts and after the step is finished. And then we have a lot of more listeners, like a chunk listener that um, gets active once before the transaction, uh, that gets active before a chunk is processed and after a chunk is processed. And item read, item process listener and item write listener. Those, all of them have like three methods, before write, before read, before process and after, and on error. So you, can, you get access uh, then if an error happens or before or after writing, reading, and processing. And we have a skip listener that's important if you want to do something with your skipped items. Um, if, if you configured skip before, then uh, you need to, maybe you need to lock them or you need to save them to another place where you can uh, later examine what to do with those items that have been skipped in the batch run. So that's the skip listener for. Yes. Any questions so far? No. So, some batch processing news. So, Spring Batch 2.2 was released in June, um, the 2.20. Um, by now, we are uh, in Spring Batch 2.2.2. And um, yeah, it has some lot of bug fixes and some new features. Um, for example, it has uh, support for Spring Data. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Spring Data project. It's an umbrella project for accessing uh, data stores, uh, any uh, data store, but a lot of JDBC and JPA as well, but a lot of uh, NoSQL data stores as well. So it has support for those um, Spring Data repositories, and it has support for some special, um, it has di more direct support for some special um, um, data stores like MongoDB or Neo4j or uh, Gemfire, for example. Um, yeah, as I said before, they have now non-identifying job parameters. Um, before, as I said, every job parameter was identifying, but that wasn't always very sensible. So they changed it a little bit so that you can have a non-identifying job parameter. And uh, the most important thing, I think, is uh, support for Java-based configuration. Um, who of you is using Java-based configuration in Spring? Okay. Hmm? No, not annotations. Java, Java config, that's, that's a different thing, because Java config is, uh, is, is still a central configuration, like XML, but it's just in Java classes. So annotation is, uh, is um, annotation configuration just move, uh, is in your business classes, um, and uh, Java config is has their own separate configuration. But I will get into it, I think, now, yeah. As you see, this is a XML-based configuration, and this is Java-based configuration that they added, like, now almost four years ago to Spring 3.0. So we have these classes that gets, gets annotated with add configuration, and that means that it's the whole class is just a configuration class, exactly like an XML file. And every um, bean that you want to create gets an annotation at bean. That's like a similar thing to, to this, um, this bean declaration here. And um, yeah, now you can do everything in Java, which has some, uh, uh, which is some advantages. It's always type safe. We have uh, good refactoring support and everything like that. So I really like it. And um, yeah, we have in, in, in XML-based configuration, have we, those, have we, we have those namespaces, like uh, this transaction namespace that let us easily configure uh, in a very concise space um, that we want to use annotation-driven uh, transaction management. And this, these things are there in um, Java config as well as an annotation. So this enable transaction management is the same like TX annotation-driven. So this is um, Java config and uh, Spring Batch uh, 2.2 now supports Java config as well. And we see it here. There's a new annotation 
that's enable batch processing. And this uh, enable batch processing annotation just needs the data source, so you need to configure a bin of type data source, and if you do that, it configures all the infrastructure um, for you. So it configures, uh, it creates a job repository, a job launcher, a job res registry, a data source transaction manager on the data source, and um, a job builder factory and a step builder factory for creating jobs and steps. So your, an infrastructure configuration for your uh, Spring Batch jobs could look like this. You put an annotation here, enable batch processing, and provide the data source, like I said before, and that's it. Um, all the um, infrastructure is configured like that. And now if you want to, do, uh, want to do configure a batch job, you can do it like this. This is the job configuration, and we just auto-wire the job builder factory or the step builder factory in it um, that, uh, that are already added, uh, um, con automatically added by the um, enable batch processing annotation. And then you can, uh, with this job builder factory, you can uh, uh, yeah, configure your job and your step. So we have here the chunk, the reader, and the processor, and the writer, like we have it added in XML as well. This is a little bit badly um, um, formatted, so I would, I would prefer to have it under, so, so it's easier to read, because uh, like this, uh, it maybe looks a little bit strange if you do it just like in line, one line. But here you access the step that you configure here, and so you can, in your configurations, you can jump between all those uh, configurations quite easily. Yeah, so, um, the next thing is the JSR 352. Um, so there, has, uh, there uh, hasn't been a standard for batch processing for a long time, although batch processing is quite an important topic uh, with enterprise companies still. So, um, the um, IBM actually started to do uh, a standardization for batch processing. So the spec lead um, is Chris, was Chris Vignola uh, from IBM. And, uh, but VMware, okay, it's not VMware anymore, now it's Pivotal, but uh, you know, the Spring guys, uh, they, had, they had two p uh, people on this uh, specification. Uh, Michael Minella, which is the Spring Batch lead um, at, uh, at the current time and Rainland, and they, they haven't been in the specification from the beginning, but uh, they uh, were added later in the process. And now the, the result is that the specification is quite one-to-one uh, -one Spring Batch, so if you're familiar with Spring Batch, you, you will be easily, uh, it will be easy to use the, the, the standardization. So Spring Batch 3.0 will um, implement this standardization, um, it's JSR 352, and it will be in very interesting to see how um, the implementation of IBM will look like and if it compete, can compete with Spring Batch in any way. Yeah. And the last thing, Spring Batch and Hadoop. Um, you now Spring Batch is, is uh, about um, traditional batch processing, uh, but in the big data space we have uh, a new batch processing um, yeah, products like Hadoop, for example, and um, there's a, a Spring Data project for accessing uh, Hadoop with, uh, yeah, in a Spring way, I th I say, I'd say, and yeah, there's the version 1.0 since the beginning of this year, and you can use it yeah, it covers, yeah, you can use it for doing any Hadoop uh, um, configuration to do uh, development for Hadoop. For, so it, it covers uh, not only MapReduce, it covers Hive and Pick and all those other um, features as well that you have there on, the, uh, on Hadoop. And for example, you can um, use Spring Batch to start Hadoop jobs. That's how it's done here. We have a job with a step, and the step um, refers to um, Hadoop Tasklet, and the Hadoop Tasklet um, refers to a Hadoop job that is here, the mapper and the reducer is configured here, and um, yeah, it started like this. 
So what, what's the use of it? Uh, if you have some combination of uh, traditional batch processing and Hadoop processing, um, it, you can do, for example, a step flow um, with a lot of with different steps. And the first step could be some traditional batch process, and the second step could be some Hadoop process, and then um, yeah, you do a traditional batch job again, so you can combine those things. Um, and when, when another thing that I uh, saw on, on the Spring One, uh, like two months ago, um, they have now, uh, I don't know, uh, do you know Yarn with Hadoop 2.0? Yet another resource negotiator, that's the, um, it's the foundation of Hadoop 2.0. And now it's not only possible to do mapper and reducer tasks, to distribute mapper and reducer tasks uh, on different nodes, but you can distribute any Java code on different nodes. So they had a um, um, presentation where they distributed a batch, a traditional spring batch job over different nodes with the YARN framework that was quite interesting and yeah, interesting to see how that works. Okay, then that was it. Thanks.